Ian, how did you land with Ring of Honor? Sure. Uh, it's actually it's a long story, but it's an it's an easy story. I, I knew I always wanted to do wrestling. Um, I was trying to to break in to just broadcasting. That's what my degree is in from NYU, and I was just trying to do whatever I could. I, I came out of school in a bad economy. Um, I made some great connections when I was in school. I was on MTV a couple times. Um, I worked for TV commercial director agents, and so I, I got to know a lot of different people, but there just there just wasn't a lot of opportunity, um, especially with the financial situation I was in coming out in 2009. It was the, the beginning of the Great Recession. Uh, the economy had, had collapsed, and I couldn't really afford to stay in New York City to do intern level work that a lot of folks have to do, myself included, to get where you want to go and to get experience that you need. So I moved home with my parents. I went to graduate school. I started a public access show with my friend Chris Freed, who's now had a lot of success. He's a comedian who appears on uh, Fox News quite often. And he, you know, he just kept encouraging me, hey, do my show, do my show, help me out, help you know, help write it, help produce it. From that, uh, that opened the door because I'd write, written for a Phillies blog. The Phillies were really good. They'd won the World Series in 08. And I was writing for philliesnation.com. I helped turn our vlog into a video, uh, to a TV show on public access. Uh, from there, it got picked up on cable, on Comcast Sportsnet, which was really cool in Philadelphia. And then from there, I met the Blue Meanie. Uh, because I was doing interviews with famous Phillies fans. And the Blue Meanie uh, was one of those guys. He's a huge Phillies fan. Uh, he goes to a lot of the games, still lives in South Philly. He said, hey, where do you want to do the interview? And I said, I can come down to you. He said, if you're going to come all that way, we might as well go to the Monster Factory in Paulsburg, New Jersey. So he and I went to the Monster Factory, met Danny Cage, met Larry Sharp. I called Danny Cage a few weeks, a few days later and said that, uh, Hey, my friend would like to be involved in professional wrestling. My friend would like to do interviews and commentary. And uh, he picked up what I was, the signals I was sending, and he said, if your friend wants to do that, you should come by, learn to set up the ring, break down the ring, take tickets, run an event, set up the chairs, you know, do all kinds of stuff. And uh, I, I took him at his word, and I did everything Danny Cage said and asked of me. And from there, there was a tryout for wrestlers with Kevin Kelly, who came to the Monster Factory. And um, I asked Danny if I could attend, and he said, sure. And so I came in my suit, delivered my promos, my interviews, told me to do a 60-second sell for the event that night, and I did. I had my time cue on the dot. Told me to take it down to 30 and make it serious. I did that. Told me to communicate good news, bad news. He, and he was just kind of testing me on the spot to see how I'd react. And um, you know, I did all those things, and he told me to start coming around. And by July 2014, I was uh, appearing regularly as an interviewer, as a an arena host, um, as a correspondent for Ring of Honor. And then called my first match for them January 3rd, 2015, and uh, started doing full events by the next year after doing a lot of Future of Honor, Women of Honor matches. And then 2017, February, I called my first TV tapings, and that's why I took over for Kevin Kelly. We're searing down a different road now. I've signed another side road here. So did you learn from Kevin Kelly? Absolutely. I, I learned a lot. I learned about uh, the pacing and the emotion and different ways of communicating that. The instinct, I think, for a lot of broadcasters, whether it's wrestling or baseball, is to fill the dead air. And a lot of times my favorite part a baseball broadcast, whether it's the Phillies or, or the Iron Pigs, is just the, the murmur of the crowd. You know, the pitcher will come set, and you can hear the murmur, and you can feel it, and the anticipation building until the pitch comes. And the same can be said about wrestling, where I think the most talented broadcasters are the ones that know how to manipulate the silence and how to manipulate their own dead air. And understand pacing and understand you know what the audience might be feeling or what they're expecting or what they might want to soak in so for me kevin kelly taught me you know those were the big elements there and there have been other guys as well our producer mark brown 
uh, was really instrumental in getting me comfortable with commercial breaks and pay-per-view pitches and all of that fun stuff. So, you know, there's been a, there's been a lot of help, <laughs> so to speak, um, as I've as I've taken the role. But Kevin taught me a lot. Our executive producer, uh, Delirious, has taught me a lot, and Mark Brown has taught me a lot as well. You did grunt work. You paid your dues. You were at the Monster Factory. Very famous, by the way. Ian, could you wrestle? <laughs> so I'm, I'm six foot tall. I'm 225 pounds. Uh, I was a multi-sport athlete in high school, and I played baseball in college. I've always wanted to wrestle. Um, that was a dream of mine until I uh, landed on my back at the Wild Samoans Training Center when I was 17 years old, helping my friend Chris film a college project. <laughs> uh, that that one that one time landing flat on my back knocked the wind out of me, and I didn't tuck my chin. Um, that right there told me I wasn't tough enough to <laughs> to live the wrestling lifestyle. So. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes I wonder. I, I've wrestled one match. Uh, I, I scored a big elbow drop off the top rope, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna retire one and zero. I'm gonna retire undefeated. Um, you know, those, those dreams, uh, they, they came and went. You know, I used to wrestle on the trampoline. I used to wrestle. I used to do the backyard wrestling. Yeah, I used to, I used to wear fun costumes and make cardboard championship belts. That was all fun. I'm going to leave it to the professionals, the guys that, that have the skill, um, the guys that have the knowledge and the technique. And uh, I'll leave it to them because I had, my, I had my 15 seconds where I got to jump off the top rope. My team won the match. I got a win with Colt Cabana last November. So I'm good. I'm good with retiring 1-0. and But it's something, you know, I'd always wondered, you know, and I and, you know, I still, from time to time, I, I've rolled around the mats at the Monster Factory. I've rolled around the mats at, at Cheeseburger and Sumi Sakai School, the Worldwide Dojo. I've done drills. I like to remain active. I like to remain athletic. I'm going to leave it to them, though. They're, they're the pros. And, uh, yeah, I think the, the ship has passed for the most part. <laughs> All right, so when you did the flying elbow off the top rope, was that you going to your inner macho man, Randy Savage? Um, there, uh, there were family members that said, how many times did you practice that? It looks like you've done that a hundred times. And I said, I, I had two, I had two attempts. I had one earlier in the day when I knew that I'd be wrestling where I thought, well, if I get a chance, I'm going to, I'm going to rip off this elbow. And I did it from the second rope. And then I, I had the one you, everybody saw <laughs> from the top rope and the reason I was able to do it like I did was because I've probably done that 10,000 times jumping off my mom's bed onto the floor as a kid, <laughs> you know? So uh, between that or jumping off the, the sofa, which is ironic now because that's, that's the most annoying thing my little guy does, and, and he's such a good boy, but you know, jumping on the sofa drives me crazy. And no, no, Riccoboni, no, wait a second. Now, see, when mom was telling you not to do that in the house, look where it got you. Don't stunt this kid's growth. Let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> we could have the next Ring of Honor World Champion. Yeah, he he loves it. He's been around the ring. He's been to a number. He's been to a lot of big events for Ring of Honor. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. Hey, Ian, don't don't try not to be modest with this one. Really, you played baseball. Then did you get you? You said you went to NYU. Did you play baseball there? Then you got a scholarship to play ball there. I, just academic. Okay, so it was academic. Hey, good for you. That's even better. But you did play ball at NYU, no? I did, yes. So what was that like? I mean, did you have, even before then, then, did you have aspirations, too, of like, hey, maybe I could play pro ball one day. I want to be a major leaguer. Was that something growing up? It, it, it was something growing up, but by the time I was a freshman in high school, it was very clear to me that, that I, had a, <laughs> I had a feeling that I could achieve and uh you know, it would be difficult to get. It'd be difficult to get past where I, I ended up. I think, you know, I'm very happy with the the level of effort um, I put into it. I got out of it as much as I got. I put into it and uh, made a lot of lifelong friends, whether it be at Salisbury High School or NYU. Um, but 
like, yeah, it, it's a dream until you until you see somebody that first week playing JV baseball who's already throwing, you know, 90 with a curveball you can't hit. And <laughs> you got to figure out, you know, as a, as a 14-year-old, that, you know, well, I guess we can cross major leagues off. I guess we can cross minor leagues off. Maybe, maybe we'll shoot for college. Maybe we'll try to play college ball. So you weren't going to be the next Ryan Howard then, right? No, no, <laughs> never. <laughs> Okay, you got to tell me. I, I'm hope, I hope I'm right on this now. You said you went to Salisbury High School. Ian Riccoboni, tell me they had Salisbury Steak Night. Uh, uh, that was more of an elementary school thing. We, occasionally, uh, we had Salisbury Steak in elementary school. Harry S. Truman, elementary school. Uh, they would have Salisbury Steak Day. Uh, we were not the Salisbury. The Salisbury Steak was named after. <laughs> Uh, they did have, yeah, they did serve Salisbury steak on occasion. Oh, come on, Rick or Bonnie. Say it was so we could have some nice something on the video. <laughs> something go viral. Ian says that they named the Salisbury steak after this. <laughs> the school was oh, there. I, I'll tell you what, they named the elementary school after Harry S. Truman, uh, in part because my grandmother, when she worked at the school, formerly the Washington School, reached out to Harry S. Truman's widow and got her written permission to name it after President Truman. That's very cool. That is yeah. very, that's a really cool story there. Oh, my gosh. All right, so you graduate from NYU. You, you mentioned Chris Freed. Did you meet Chris at NYU? Was he an NYU grad, too, or no? No, he was, uh, he was Salisbury High School. He was two years ahead of me. Um, we love Bruce Springsteen. We love wrestling. We hung out. Uh, you know, he, he looked at looked at me like a little brother a lot. I looked up to him. Um, we, there wasn't a lot of folks that had made an impact from my high school. Uh, I think in large part just because it's so small. It's a small public high school. I graduated class out about 130. So just the odds of somebody, you know, striking it big or making it big or, or creating a path were relatively low. Even though in Allentown, we had Christine Taylor. We had Amanda Seyfried. Uh, we had uh, Tim and Eric from, from Tim and Eric's uh, awesome job. We had you know, a number of big athletes from Bethlehem, like uh, Andre Reed of the Buffalo Bills. And even Matt Riddle. You know, Matt Riddle was an Allentown guy. Uh, his family moved but to upstate New York. But, you know, in the UFC, he was a guy that, you know, we identified from Allentown. Uh, we had Saquon Barkley from Whitehall, which is, you know, right across the border from Allentown. So... A lot of people, a lot of big names came from the Lehigh Valley, but, you know, the, the Allentown area didn't have much representation. And, you know, Chris, I think, was always determined to kind of break out and, and to say that, you know, hey, so there's, there's folks from Salisbury that can do it too. Because we were very fortunate growing up. Um, you know, we came, from, we came from solid homes. We got good education at Salisbury. And we had a really solid foundation and it would be a shame to, to waste any of that. And Chris went his way. Um, he interned at Saturday Night Live. He had interned at Conan O'Brien. He went on to work for, for some of those entities. He actually went on to work for the WWE at one point. And, um, you know, I myself was just trying to create a path and uh, trying to get where I wanted to go. And, you know, there's a lot of me and a big part of me that, that really just wants to make, you know, Salisbury proud and Allentown proud, especially now that my wife and I are raising our kids there. That's so interesting. And it's your journey, your path is so interesting. And listening about Chris, that's another interesting journey, too. Okay. I'm, well, can, I, can I at least write this? That Ian Riccoboni and Chris Freed are the most famous Salisbury High School graduates. <laughs> That's probably factually accurate. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. I mean, I don't know if we're the most talented though. We have a we have a friend who graduated a year before Chris, uh, who kind of helped also helped this, and, and she's helped us in different ways. She's won eleven Mid Atlantic Emmys for her work in video production. So, is she a, is she a wrestling fan? Is she a wrestling fan? She and her husband are. Yeah, and her husband went to nearby Emmaus High School. So. All right, yeah, we'll have to, if she's a wrestling fan, okay, we might have to include her too. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Urich is her name. <laughs> That's great. Okay, let's, we're going to wrap this up. Obviously, we want to talk some Ring of Honor too. What do we got, upcoming schedule for Ring of Honor? What things that you can tell us, some shows and 
that's coming up here? Absolutely. We have a stacked lineup coming up, and our, our schedule's been announced all the way through April. And I think a lot of people have Supercard of Honor as, as their go-to event that's kind of locked in their radar, right? That's April 4th and Saturday. The big WrestleMania weekend is in Lakeland, Florida. We know Marty Stroll is going to take on Jay White. Um, and, and a lot of the stars from Bullet Club and New Japan are going to be there. Uh, a lot of big names already confirmed. Uh, but if you focus on that event as big as, and impressive as that's going to be, we're going to have you know, a few thousand people in, in, in Lakeland. I think you risk overlooking what we got going on this Friday on the 28th, where we have uh, where we have Bound by Honor in Nashville. We have a, a champion versus champion match, Dragon Lee versus PCO, the TV champ versus the world champ. The winner goes on the next night in St. Charles, Missouri, right near St. Louis, to defend the title against Roosh, the former champ, and Mark Haskins, one of the top contenders. The person that emerges the champion and the person that does not take the fall in that match they will go on to 18th anniversary in Las Vegas, which is March 13th. March 14th is, is probably the, the most unique event Ring of Honor's ever done. That's also in Las Vegas. On March 14th, it's past versus present. So you're going to see a lot of the big stars from the past, like Matt Seidel, Homicide, guys that are still top-flight professional wrestlers that just haven't, haven't been in Ring of Honor for a minute. And, and some of the guys, some of the more fun guys, like Grizzly Redwood, Delirious, uh, but also guys maybe looking for a second chance, like Ricky Reyes. You know, those are the kind of guys who are going to be in Las Vegas, going to be fighting tooth and nail against the top stars from today. And so from Vegas, we go to Lakeland, where we will see, you know, all the top stars. We mentioned Marty versus Jay White, the headlining match. We'll have a little bit more clarity around the, the world championship coming out of Vegas to see who's competing for the world championship there. But then the schedule gets super interesting because we start the pure – championship tournament so the pure championship for a lot of fans uh newer fans they might not know is a, a championship contest under pure rules no closed fist strikes and you get three rope breaks on pinfalls or submissions if you exhaust those you can you risk being pinned while being in the ropes or being submitted while on the ropes so it takes away the idea that you can get to the ropes to break up a fall or a submission that tournament is going to start in columbus in april it's going to continue in pittsburgh the next night and then if new york and philadelphia you're going to see the quarterfinals so it's going to go from 16 all the way down to four by the end of philadelphia and uh the schedule is just getting you know wilder and wilder i there's a, a former iwgp champion in the tournament for the pure title there's a new japan young line in the tournament there's multiple former pure champions in that tournament and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the women's the women's championship, the all-age women's world title. That's also going to start the tournament to crown that champion. We're going to see some huge women of honor, uh, ring of honor women debuts uh, starting in Philadelphia at the quest for gold, coming through New York. It's going to be a wild couple of months and weeks because I think I think we're at a point right now where we have so many new stars whether it's the crop from last year, which is Bandito, PCO, Mark Haskin, uh, you name it, or the stars that, that are just coming in this year, like uh, Ray Orris. We have Nicole Savoy on the women's side, uh, Flex from Australia, Session Moth Martina from Ireland. Um, it, it's amazing. Ring of Honor is just going all over the world, picking up some of the best stars and bringing them right here in America so you can see it live. I talked about it earlier. There's, it, it's an affordable night for the family, it's something you got to experience, experience to, to believe. We had a great time in Baltimore. We had a couple thousand folks there. And, um, you know, it's just, it was something where there's an electricity. When you see these guys and gals, you know, lock up. And when you see them lock in submissions and, and go at it. And that's really the bread and butter of what Ring of Honor is all about. So, you know, whether it is Nashville, St. Charles, Las Vegas, uh, whether it is Lakeland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, New York City, Philadelphia. That's the calendar through April. We have a loaded slate of events. All the top stars are going to be there. Villain Enterprises, uh, La Facion and Gobernables, the you know, women stars like Nicole Savoy, Sumi Sakai, The Allure, Session Ma. Uh, we have some debuts that we haven't even announced yet that I'm aware of, but I, I can't quite tell you, Jim. I'm sorry. Uh, but those are going to be the, the things to look out for. Um, 2020 is going to be a year, I think, of... You know, I 
think in 2019 we built the foundation once all of our, you know, some of our stars left. And now in 2020, it's time to take the leap. And you've seen that with guys like Mark Haskins, Ben Dito, Tracy Williams, Jonathan Gresham, who had goals for the first time. And uh, those are some of the stars that are stepping up. Vincent is another guy to keep an eye on. Uh, in the righteous, Joe Hendry. And those are the guys that are going to have to take the leap in 2020. And then these new stars that we have coming in, uh, those are the, the next men up, next men and women up. And we're building quite a foundation. We're building quite a, an exciting series of events. And if you've never been to Ring of Honor Live or if you've never watched us live, check us out on Honor Club. And, and I think you'll like what you see. And that's why I like talking to you, because you know everything that's going on in Ring of Honor. <laughs> I can just sit back and be quiet, and you can tell us everything, Ring of Honor. This is so cool. And you know what? Hey, www.rohwrestling.com is a place to check things out. You mentioned Honor Club. All the shows streaming via Honor Club. No offense to our Canadian people, fans. We love them. But it's the American spelling. H-O-N-O-R-C-L-U-B. <laughs> with Honor Club. So we spell it correctly so people will know when they click where to go on that as well. So you can always check all of that out. It is so cool. And then also, Ian, what about the weekly TV? How can people check out weekly TV? Because I get it in South Florida. I get it here. A couple of stations will get charged TV. So I get it on that. There's also uh, Fox Sports Florida. We get it on that. What what are some of the channels we can watch Ring of Honor on TV weekly? Absolutely. So if you have a Fox Sports affiliate, you're, you're able to watch this every Friday night at midnight, Friday into Saturday, and, and it's um, a great time. And it's something where you'll see Quinn. She'll introduce the matches, and you'll hear Caprice and I, and you'll see the best wrestling on the planet. If you're in a, in a market with a Sinclair affiliate, you can go to allwaywrestling.com. You can type in your zip code. And you'll get a listing to see if Ring of Honor is available on a local affiliate, like a, an ABC, CBS, NBC type channel. Um, or you can, uh, you may be able to find us through Charge, which of course is a, uh, you know, a nice over-the-air station that I like Charge because it's got Ring of Honor and American Gladiators. So that's why I like Charge. And uh, we're going to be on, hopefully, in the next couple of months in some of the, I call it the expanded universe of the Fox Sports stations. So our fingers are crossed. You know, in the deal that, that Sinclair uh, had to purchase the Fox Sports stations, that also included Marquee, which is the Chicago Cubs channel. So my fingers are crossed that we'll be in Chicago soon. And, uh, yeah, those are some of the ways to watch it. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not on in your area, and there's very few areas now where that is the case. You go to ROHwrestling.com. The latest episodes are up every Monday on Fight TV, Fight.TV. You can watch them also. I like Honor Club and Fight TV because you can take them on your devices. You can take them to your favorite coffee shop, donut place, put your headphones in, have a nice cup of coffee, watch Ring of Honor right there, use their Wi-Fi, don't use your data, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and you can catch up with all the, uh, the latest Ring of Honor action. That is so good, Ian, and thank you, too. Thanks for the extended time, because I really wanted to talk to you, and there was a lot to cover. Hey, I, I, I could spend another half hour, hour with you just talking about a whole bunch of different things, but I want to wrap it up with this. Is there anyone in Ring of Honor that you would like to call a match with? Wow. Um, yeah, I... There's a lot of folks. What's interesting, I've... I've have Ian, been... have you... Hey, Ian, have you, have you called a match with Dalton Castle? I have. Uh, and Dalton keeps me on my toes. <laughs> um, Dalton really keeps me on my toes. I'll, I'll tell you what. The guy that I had the best chemistry with that I didn't expect to have any with, and this goes back to 2016, and we haven't called a match since then uh, that I can remember. Maybe we called one in 2017, but, but not since. Matt Taven. Yeah, I had Matt Taven listed here. That's so funny. I put Dalton Castle and Matt Taven down. Yeah, Matt just has something natural. You mentioned about Caprice with really no background professional training. No. Matt seems that way, too, even on his promos. Absolutely, and Matt has a great podcast, uh, the Take a Bump podcast, where uh, he's got great chemistry with his, his co-host, Danny Picard. Uh, Matt's a natural talker. Again, I, I think what comes through best in broadcasters, people can tell when you're being yourself. People can tell when you're being genuine, when you're being authentic, when you care about the, the person and the time that you're spending with them. Um, you know, you can, money can buy a lot of things, but it can never replace the time and attention you give somebody. And Matt Taven's the kind of guy where 
if you're talking to him, you have his time and attention. And that's something that I think makes a really good broadcaster. I think that's the, the thread that connects all the great partners that I've had and, you know, any of the great broadcasters that are out there, whether it be WWE, AEW, Impact, or so on. And you know what I just realized, too, in listening to your answer and what I wrote down, I wrote down Dalton Castle and Matt, and I just realized, too, that both of them were incredible with Dan Housen on that video I saw. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why, too, I wrote them down. <laughs> Ian, any social media for you, and we'll let you go. Absolutely, at Ian Riccoboni, R-I-C-C-A-B-O-N-I. Uh, that's everything, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I don't have any fakes. I do have a blue check mark, though. I think I'm the, the only person that has never been imitated that has a blue check mark. <laughs> uh, so if you find the blue check, that's me. Um, and then also right now I'm doing a fun pro project, a, a podcast called Last Stop Penn Station with Carrie Silken. That's laststoppennstation.com, where we live in a lot of the history of Ring of Honor, a lot of, of Carrie's history as a ticket broker, as a ticket scalper and hustler in New York City. Um, we're, talk, we're trying to weave those stories into some of the stories about Ring of Honor going to Japan for the first time, going to the UK for the first time. But also, you know, just some of the, the, the trials and tribulations Kerry's gone through and, and what he's overcome. Um, overcoming addiction, overcoming a lot of stigma in New York City with, uh, with his identity. So, you know, that's something that I'm really proud to be a part of. I'm proud to get those stories out. And uh, it's been a lot of fun working with Carrie on, on that. And you can find that on, on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Last Stop Penn Station, or go to laststoppennstation.com. That's awesome. And, you know, with so many podcasts out there, that sounds like something different. Yeah, there's, you know, Carrie, Carrie's got the, the perspective of, of being an owner. You know, I think we shocked people in episode one when we when we told the world that Kerry did not make money on Ring of Honor. You know, you have these amazing jam-packed buildings, but you're flying in people from Japan. You're flying in people from, from California to Philadelphia. And, you know, that comes at an expense. And Kerry, for the entire time he owned Ring of Honor, for lack of a better term, did it for the love of the game. You know, Kerry's personal finances were financing Ring of Honor, and they were making sure Ring of Honor was afloat. And so, you know, to find that out in episode one, I think, shocked a lot of people. Um, there was only ever one tour where Ring of Honor made money under Kerry, and it wasn't because of financial mismanagement. It was because that was the cost of doing business. But Kerry believed in Ring of Honor for so long and, and believed in what it was and what it could be uh, that he was willing to do whatever it took to, to keep it afloat and to get it into safe harbor. Um, now, you know, I don't think I've ever been prouder than, than to walk, you know, through Madison Square Garden with Kerry to be able to, you know, share that moment with him, to take photos, to take pictures, and really just enjoy myself. So that's, you know, for me to not having been on the, the beginning of the journey with Kerry, but to be there to see the company he helped create, grow, and foster headline Madison Square Garden and, and to be, you know, just to be at the pinnacle, to, to be at the arena that he would go to as a kid, um, it just, was just stunning to me. And I think a lot of people enjoyed it. I think, uh, you know, for Kerry, I, I hope it was a moment that uh, he really took credit for, that he really... You know, I hope he knows how much he did to make that moment happen. You know, the thankless years of losing millions of dollars to keep Ring of Honor in operation and keep it the place to be. Well, that very well said with that. And just to let you know, Ring of Honor's World Title Tournament, April 24th, Philadelphia, Quest for the Gold, which you did mention. Kellyanne, native of Melbourne, Australia, will compete in the tournament. That was announced, Mark K, Ring of Honor PR extraordinaire. So you're not in any trouble, Ian. He made the announcement on that. I'm just reading it. There you go. All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just one of the debuts. I got another one up my sleeve that, that might blow your mind. No, no, don't leave us like that. Don't leave us like that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank 